Hello, um, welcome to Courtney Vale's presentation. She is the campaign director at Oceanic Preservation Society and an advisor for Rocky Mountain Wolf Project. And she will be doing a presentation on restoring wolves to Colorado. So welcome Courtney. Courtney, are you there? Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Okay, great. And do you need me to start my video? Um, if you don't want to, you don't have to. We can see your presentation, um, but probably for questions. Okay, that sounds great. That sounds great. All right, well, let's get started. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm so grateful to be here with you today to share a little bit about our important work in Colorado, uh, and that I hope that can serve as an example for species advocacy and recovery everywhere. I'm Courtney Vale, and I'm the campaign director at Oceanic Preservation Society, and also an advisor for the Rocky Mountain Wolf Project. During the lead up to Proposition 114, which is what I'm going to talk about today. There was a public ballot initiative that became law in Colorado in November of 2020. And the Rocky Mountain Wolf Project was a large coalition of scientists, volunteer activists, organizations, and policymakers working together towards the common goal to reintroduce the gray wolf back to Colorado. And on November 3rd of 2020, with more than 3 million votes cast, citizen-led Proposition 114 passed by a very slim margin of 1%. This initiative is significant because it is the first time in history that citizens in the United States have used direct democracy to instigate the restoration of an endangered species. So now the Rocky Mountain Wolf Project is a project under the Biophilia Foundation and consists of just five advisors, and I am one of them. I'm also the campaign director at the Oceanic Preservation Society, and our mission is to inspire, empower, and connect a global community using high impact films like documentaries and visual storytelling to expose critical issues facing our planet. And before I proceed, I did want to have a moment to discuss the power of film and the power of imagery and to take a precautionary moment with all of you um, there are some potentially disturbing images that I might share in my presentation that will be later in my presentation. And at OPS, we believe in the concept of bearing witness. And that is something we do with our films. And that means we often have to confront uncomfortable images. And in current times, the media often sensationalizes imagery. But most importantly, these videos and images reveal sometimes our mistreatment of each other or our mistreatment of the natural world. And sometimes justice requires us to shine a light on these images and expose the truth. I don't believe that we benefit the causes that we care about by shielding our eyes from reality, especially at this point in your education. And any graphic images that I share will be few, but they are powerful and depict our broken relationship with other creatures that we share our planet with. And so my goal is not to shock or distress you, but hopefully to motivate you. And I will give you advance warning uh, before the one video that I will share and uh, allow you to either mute and um, turn off your camera until the video is over. So I just wanted to give you a little bit advance notice before that time. Um, if you don't mind me cutting. Yeah. Cutting in for just one second. Yeah. Um, so for the turning off the camera, it's not um, necessarily turning off the camera, but at the top of the Zoom, you should be able to like either click outside of it so that you can't see the screen, but you can still hear the audio. Um, or um, so that it won't like completely have you leave the Zoom. Okay, thanks for those instructions. 
So for those that to, um, resume, sorry. Oh, that's okay. Thanks. And for those that heard me present last year, this slide will be familiar, but the mission of OPS is to expose crimes against nature with our documentaries, some of which are depicted here on this slide. So we expose whale and dolphin hunting, the wildlife trade, deforestation, and, and many, many other issues. So this is just a brief note to really show the heart of OPS and the power of film and the power of imagery. Many of you might know us from our Academy Award winning film, The Cove. It was our first film and it was released in 2009. And when we talk about inspiring action, sometimes a documentary is the best place to start. Because of The Cove, for instance, dolphin meat was removed from school lunches in Japan. And all of, although the hunts continue, unfortunately, there has been a decline in the numbers of dolphins killed annually. And most importantly, there's a rise in activism against the hunts from within Japan itself. And of course, we believe that that is the only way that these hunts will truly end is when the people of Japan or a people of, of any country decide that, that they must end the hunts and challenge their governments. And this brings us to wolves and why Proposition 114 is so important to talk about. Colorado has gone nearly 80 years without wolves. The last wolf was shot in Colorado in 1945. You can see how many gray wolves uh, uh, exist in small populations across the United States today, including uh, the separate species of the red wolf on the East Coast. And wolves were eliminated through their historic range across the US by the mid 1900s. So establishing a population in the Southern Rocky Mountains in Colorado would serve to reconnect a continuous population of wolves from Canada to Mexico. Migrant wolves coming into Colorado from Wyoming have not been able to establish a viable population in Colorado. And if they have been lucky enough to survive the gauntlet of hunting that is occurring in, in surrounding states, they have not lasted long in Colorado. So restoring wolves to Colorado restores nature and corrects misdirected predator eradication programs that have been waged against the wolf across the United States. So in Colorado, Public citizens were tired of waiting for the government or regulatory agencies that were dragging their feet on restoring the wolf to Colorado, primarily because wolves are controversial. And we will talk about that later in my presentation. But wolves have ecological, intrinsic and economic value. We, we believe that wolves have the right to play their important role in the natural ecosystem, separate from any economic value they might have to human beings. We have the unfortunate distinction of being in the middle of the sixth grade extinction, or what the scientists are calling Anthropocene. One million species worldwide are at risk of extinction. In the United States alone, 40% of all animals and 34% of all plants are at risk of extinction. In our, in our second film called Racing Extinction, if you haven't seen it, I suggest you, you watch it. Uh, and I hope you take the time to, it, it speaks to the acceleration of species extinctions and climate change. But in 1995, gray wolves were reintroduced in the Northern Rocky Mountains. And in 2011, they were removed from the federal endangered species list in that region under separate congressional actions. So because of this, states of Idaho, Montana, and Wyoming now have statewide management authority for gray wolves. And I'm going to speak to you later in the presentation on why this matters. But everywhere else, wolves were delisted from the protection of the Endangered Species Act under the last administration in 2020. But then that decision was reversed in 2022 when a federal court ruled against that decision and returned protections for the gray wolf under the Endangered Species Act, except in those, those three states of Idaho, Montana, and Wyoming. And, and parts of Oregon and Washington. So unfortunately, those three states are undertaking wolf eradication programs, escalating wolf hunting to reduce wolf populations. And this is important because we need and hope that Colorado will be different when we are successfully restoring wolves to the state. Finally, why wolves and why Colorado? When we talk about the public trust, we are talking about those natural resources, including wildlife and wildlands that belong to all of us and that belong to the public good. So management agencies are supposed to manage wildlife for all of us. That means we all are stakeholders and participants in protecting nature. So the ballot initiative was one way for the public to directly participate in influencing how wildlife is managed and protected. 
So I referenced earlier that wolves are controversial, perhaps more so than any other apex carnivore, whether it's bears, cougars, or coyotes, nothing stirs emotions like wolves. I have a short video that the Rocky Mountain Wolf Project put together to set the record straight and to challenge the stories and the fables that are told about the wolves. Let's take a look at the truth about wolves. And this video is suitable and appropriate for, for everyone to watch. Let's take a look here. Everyone loves a good story. One of our favorite characters is the big bad wolf. But what if our fairy tales don't get it right? Think of a mother wolf. She's not interested in huffing and puffing and blowing your house down. She needs to find her own home. If her pack comes across Little Red Riding Hood in the woods, she'd make sure that her family keeps their distance and avoids conflict. Her life is full of hardship. Less than 10% of hunts are successful. Life expectancies are low. Our stories created a monster. These myths drove us to fear the wolf. By the 1950s, a population of almost half a million in the lower 48 was nearly exterminated, and more was lost than just the wolf. You can't pull a character without changing the whole plot. Remove wolves, and herd numbers can explode Rivers can erode. How wrong our narrative has been. In 1973, on the brink of extinction, wolves were one of the first animals to gain protection under the U.S. Endangered Species Act. We'd begun to understand the truth. Wolves don't attack. They avoid us. Cattle are many times more likely to be killed by bad weather than by wolves. The wolf is making a comeback. They're tracing the shores of the Great Lakes, climbing the northern Rockies, roaming the southwest, but there's a missing link. The reintroduction of wolves to Colorado would restore the natural balance. It's time for a new chapter. Everyone. All right. I hope you guys enjoyed that. The short film touched on some of this, but wolves, like all apex carnivore, carnivores, positively impact biological diversity and ecosystem function. Wolves have been instrumental in restoring biodiversity in the northern Rocky Mountains, including increasing the number of songbirds, pronghorn, antelope, lynx, and other species, while also improving the ecology of lakes and streams. Wolves keep deer and elk herds healthy. Wolves have evolved over millennia to play an important role in ecosystems. As predators, they keep deer and other ungulate populations in check and healthy, which in turn has a cascading effect on other wildlife and habitat, which is known as a trophic cascade. They are excellent at identifying vulnerable or sick prey and target individuals who are already in poor health or otherwise compromised. So wolves and other native carnivores play a critical role in suppressing the prevalence of disease in prey species, uh, including chronic wasting disease, which is an epidemic plaguing deer and elk across the United States and into Colorado. So in, in this way, wolves can actually have a strengthening effect on ungulate species, culling sick or genetically inferior deer or elk from the population and allowing healthy individuals to thrive and reproduce. As an example, there are more elk in Idaho, Montana and Wyoming now, 20 years after reintroduction of wolves in those states than before wolves arrived. In Colorado, 60% of the deer herds and 30% of elk herds have what is known as chronic wasting disease, which is always fatal. And these are signs of an unhealthy ecosystem and things will likely get much worse as human development and climate change takes a bigger bite out of our state's wildlife habitat. 
So wolves encourage what we know as, as trophic cascades or the positive knock-on effect of their presence in ecosystems. We also know that the carcasses that wolves leave behind spread nutrients to other scavenging animals, including magpies, ravens, foxes, and other predator species. And finally, by competing with, with coyotes, bears, and mountain lions, wolves can also decrease the population of other pred predators, particularly coyotes, and reshape the ways that these predators hunt. So they are restoring the balance. And that's what we mean by a balanced ecosystem. Wolves are also worth billions of dollars to state economies where they bring in tourism dollars to local communities. And good examples uh, have occurred around Yellowstone in Idaho, Montana, and Wyoming. People travel from all over the world to view wolves and listen to wolves howl, supporting local restaurants, loud lodging, and outfitters that build businesses around wolf watching. It's important to note that Yellowstone has, has hosted about 122 million visitors from all over the world and not one person has been hurt by a wolf. Recent studies demonstrate that wolves can reduce deer vehicle collisions, saving millions in, in, in the cost of programs to manage deer populations. And chronic wasting disease management program also costs money and wolves are able to keep those Keep, keep that disease in balance without, without spending millions of dollars to control uh, deer and elk populations. So in, in short, having a balanced ecosystem saves money in the short and long term. And wolves have cultural value. They have intrinsic value. And that means they have in their own right and not dependent upon their value to humans and ecosystems and economy, they have their own right to exist. But even more importantly, they've played an important and special role in indigenous cultures. Many of this land's first peoples have a symbiotic relationship with wolves and wolves have influenced the history of peoples, families, and diverse cultures. To many tribal nations, the wolf is a sacred being of great cultural and religious significance. And the wolf has a revered position and is integral to ceremonial practices. The Global Indigenous Council supported Proposition 114 uh, in Colorado and has also developed and championed the Wolf Treaty that calls for the protection of the wolf and recognizes how important the wolf is to indigenous cultures. And this, this connection is important because we should say something about the history of persecution for both native peoples and for wolves. Like indigenous nations that were persecuted, eradicated or marginalized through the westward expansion of colonialism and manifest destiny, the wolf has also been eternally persecuted. Wolf families are very similar to our own and there are deep roots of connectivity between wolves, bison and other species that were slaughtered at the hands of Euro-Americans that were conquering native lands. And this persecution continues to this day where states like Montana, Wyoming, and Idaho permit hunting and trapping of gray wolves in recreational hunting programs. These states are succeeding in making it easier for wolves to be killed. In Idaho, a 2021 law permitted hunters, trappers, and the state itself to kill up to 90% of the state's wolves. In Montana, new rules may open the door to killing about 85% of its approximately 1,200 wolves. To date, over 700 wolves have been killed by, by really brutal methods in recent hunting seasons in Idaho, Montana, and Wyoming, including the killing of young pups. At least 25 named and well-known Yellowstone wolves that the world has watched and followed and traveled to see were killed simply for stepping outside the borders of the national park where they're, where they're safe and protected. And it's taken decades for Yellowstone's wolves to regain a foothold in the wildlands surrounding uh, this national park. But this wave of cruel policies enacted by states in the Northern Rockies has unleashed the worst massacre of the region's wolves in over a hundred years. So this animosity towards wolves is around the borders of Colorado. And we're hoping that, that Colorado will be different. So the next video is where I will pause. And for those of you that do not wish to see potentially distressing images, um, I ask you to, uh, to take a few minutes uh, to step away or to mute uh, or pause your video so that uh, those of us that may wish to see 
the video can continue. So I'll give you a moment. And here we go. And I will note that this video was produced by a friend and ally, uh, Rain Bear Stands Last. And it speaks to family and it says more than I can say about this ongoing persecution. We were lost without them, children of a mother we did not understand until she sent them to us. And then we found our way. They became our guides, our teachers. We structured our families upon theirs, our tribes upon their packs, where all contribute and live in a spirit of reciprocity. We watched how they cared for their young, and so we invited them into our families to do the same, and they came. They became part of us. They are a part of you. They sang up the moon and still do. She who gives us perpetual life and light. In their songs, we hear our loves and losses, a chorus of life, and it's living until our last winter. The Natsitapi and Sisistas still recall starvation in the ancient time, until the wolf spirit blessed them and the wolves taught them how to survive, how to hunt with ceremony, to take only those with hooves and horns for sustenance, and then upon the first spring moon, it is said the wolves took the spirit trail, the Milky Way home. You love what they gave us, the many shapes of them. But too many who were estranged from the land came and carried hate for them, and still do. Who would do such a thing? I'll pause for a moment for those of you that wish to re-engage with the presentation. And that is a powerful video uh, from a powerful friend. Rain has been an advocate and has worked tirelessly to protect uh, native peoples and to protect predators and large carnivores that are targets in, in uh, management programs and for, for hunters. And much of it based on a false narrative about wolves and their impact and, and their purpose. So despite all of this, I wanted to return to uh, Proposition 114 because it provides hope for Colorado and it provides us the opportunity to correct some of the wrongs that we've done in the past as, as humankind towards some of these uh, apex predator species. Colorado voters passed Proposition 114 in 2020, which called for the reintroduction of wolves into the state by the end of December, 2023. So by the end of this year, now that this proposition is law, wolves will need to be reintroduced to Colorado. So it's an exciting time to be involved in Colorado's direct public initiative process where proposals go directly on the ballot for citizen approval rather than needing to be submitted to the legislature for passage. So this is directly the result of citizens and people like you and me who cared enough 
and worked hard enough to um, want to bring wolves back to, to their native habitat in Colorado. So as, it, as the law mandates now, the Colorado Parks and Wildlife Commission must develop a plan to reintroduce and manage gray wolves in Colorado by December 31st, 2023 on lands west of the Continental Divide. They're meant to, they have to hold statewide hearings about scientific, economic, and social considerations, and they have to periodically update the plan, and they have to use funds to assist livestock owners in preventing conflicts with gray wolves and pay fair compensation for any losses. So that's now what Proposition 14 um, has turned into in state law and is mandating for the Wildlife Management Agency to undertake. So as part of the process, and now as part of the statute, Colorado Parks and Wildlife, that I'll, I'll just now refer to as CPW, hired a facilitator to hold statewide meetings, hearings, and listening sessions to answer questions about wolf reintroduction. And during the summer of 2021, the Keystone Center held 47 public meetings across the state and developed a website where the public could submit comments. And to date, nearly 4,000 comments have been submitted through that website. From June 2021 to December of 2022, CPW assembled a technical working group, which I'll call the TWIG, and a stakeholder advisory group known as the SAG. And these two expert working groups produced recommendations to help guide the drafting of a wolf management plan that re was just released in December, at the end of December of 2022. And when we look at the plan and what the proposals are at this point, Wolves will go where they choose to go ultimately, but for the initial reintroduction, the release will be focused in those areas that have been identified as high ecological capacity, mean, meaning the habitat is prime habitat for wolves, and areas where there's low uh, social uh, potential for social interaction or social interference. So, those areas where um, there will be a lower potential for, for human conflict. And so this was based on science, and it has led to an area being identified that you'll see there in the red box, which is considered the prime release sites for wolves initially uh, when they're brought back to the state at the end of the year. The plan provides for the release of about 30 to 50 wolves in Colorado over three to five years. And those releases in the first year will of course occur somewhere in the Aspen Vale area in that, in that area that I, I show you there on the map. So in 1995 through 1996, 31 wolves were introduced to Yellowstone. By 2003, they had increased to 174 wolves. Now they've stabilized at around 100 wolves in, in Yellowstone. And we can expect a similar phenomenon in Colorado where Yellowstone is about 2.2 million acres in size and there are 17 million acres of suitable wolf habitat in Colorado. So the plan allows for wolves to be introduced as you'll see on the map on the Western slope, west of the Continental Divide. They will eventually migrate hopefully uh, across the state, but these initial areas hopefully will provide the most success in releasing the initial round of wolves to Colorado. So where are we now? The, the draft plan was released in December and the Parks and Wildlife Commission who is charged with producing the management plan has hosted five public meetings for comment. And the commission is a citizen board appointed by the governor, which sets regulations and policies for CPW. And the commission is meant to be a balanced body with representation from, from many stakeholder groups in Colorado and, and to assist CPW, the state agency responsible for managing wildlife and managing wolves. So from here, CPW will work with the commission to finalize the plan and they are meant to consider public and commissioner comments and incorporate changes. So those five meetings have just concluded and they'll be working by uh, over the next couple months by May to finalize that, that wolf management plan for, for Colorado. In tandem with this process, because wolves are an endangered species, the United States Fish and Wildlife Service must designate the population as experimental, which will allow more latitude in managing the wolves when they are introduced. This is called a 10J rule. 
and I won't get into to much more of the details, but, but a federal process is running in tandem with the state process to basically allow an endangered species to potentially be killed if there are negative interactions with livestock. Normally an endangered species uh, would not, it would not be legal to kill, but because of the experimental nature of this reintroduction and to really, um, I guess, appease uh, some of the stakeholders and to give them uh, assurances that, that if wolves do cause harm to livestock, that they can be managed uh, during this introduction period. So on a lighter note, <laughs> if you love dogs, you should thank a wolf. The, the domestication of our beloved canine companions, otherwise known as dogs, is the result of our, our long and deep relationship with wolves. And all modern dogs are descendants of wolves. Scientists suggest that this domestication event took place while humans were still hunter-gatherers. And this just further supports humankind's long history with this species. And this cartoon is really just meant to depict um, and show that relationship and also pose the question, which, which ones are better off? So what is our hope for Colorado? The historian Stephen Ambrose once said that in the 19th century, we devoted our best minds to exploring nature. In the 20th century, we devoted ourselves to controlling and harnessing it. In the 21st century, we must devote ourselves to restoring it. We really want wolves to be able to fulfill their birthright, to contribute to a balanced ecosystem and intact natural world that benefits all of us by contributing to clean air, clean water, and a, sta a stable climate. If we want our grandchildren and their grandchildren to enjoy healthy, diverse ecosystems filled with wildlife and the howl of the wolf, then we need to start now and use the best science to restore wolves to the place they once occupied. And that includes in the Colorado wilderness. So we all have a role in this journey together. And you know, and in looking at this vision, how can we get there? We need you, we need all of you. And there are lots of ways to let your voice be heard. And understanding that wolves are not protected in the Northern Rocky Mountains and understanding that they have been delisted and relisted on many occasions as, as the government changes, they're not fully protected or permanently protected. And we need to continue to call upon the Fish and Wildlife Service to relist wolves in Montana, Wyoming, and Idaho. These images show the diverse ways that others are showing support for wolves. You can sign petitions, send letters to authorities, create art, create videos and films to show the world your love for nature and for wolves and to speak up for wildlife. So in closing, I want to share some resources with you where you can find out more information or take action. And I can send uh, those links and this information directly to you uh, so that you have it. And I can also send you the presentation so that you have it. Thank you. And that is the end of my presentation. Okay, can you hear us? I can. All right. So our first question is how did you end up at the Restoring Wolves to Colorado campaign? How did you end up at OPS? Well, uh, let's start with how did I end up at OPS? That was a long journey. Uh, when I was five years old, and this is the truth, and this, this will speak to the power of images and imagery, and I, that was kind of a theme in my presentation. Um, I saw the harp seals being clubbed on TV. I don't know if you, uh, any of you have, have seen the seal uh, hunt, but uh, it's, it's, very, um, it's very compelling when you watch it. I was five years old and that sat with me. And from that moment on, I wanted to protect endangered species. I wanted to help wildlife. I was concerned about their welfare and their well-being. So uh, that led me to, in my school work, uh, to study wildlife biology. 
And then uh, I attended law school to try to learn how to use laws and policy to advocate for wildlife. Uh, and then I um, earned a psychology degree so that I could learn how to help people um, think about issues differently, uh, change their attitudes and their perceptions, and uh, tried to bring that all together in um, speaking about dogs. I have one on my lap here. <laughs> it's Mojo. Um, so bring that all together. And I worked for uh, many, many different organizations. I worked for the Fish and Wildlife Service. And so, um, yeah, uh, OPS um, and their films were really powerful for me. And I've done a lot of work in Japan with the dolphin drive hunt. So we kind of just found each other. But I've worked, I have a long history in working with many different environmental organizations. Um, uh, and with my academic background, it was just a fit. We became involved with the, with the Rocky Mountain Wolf Project uh, based on a board member of OPS living in Colorado. And OPS was founded in Colorado. And so uh, they brought me in to assist with a campaign. And then I was brought on to the advisory board. So that's a, a kind of a long-winded answer. <laughs> All right, another question we have for you is, uh, what, what other projects is OPS involved in or planning to undertake? So lots of work. I encourage you to go to our website, opsociety.org. Uh, so many of the issues in our films cover climate change, deforestation, whale and dolphin hunting, um, fisheries, bycatch, and all of the other issues that you can imagine, the wildlife trade. So we have four films in the pipeline, including on plastics and plant-based diets and protecting a, a very threatened ecosystem in Northern Sumatra where palm oil plantations are taking over uh, the wilderness. And it's a very unique ecosystem where tigers, rhinos, elephants, still coexist together in orangutan. So those are some of those projects, but the campaign work is diverse and spread out among many issues, uh, including uh, working on legislation to address whale and dolphin captivity. Um, so yeah, if you want to reach out uh, to me uh, after the presentation, I'd be happy to, to share some of that material with you or just check out our website uh, where you can find all of the work that's ongoing. All right. Um, is it true coyotes are more common in areas where wolves have been removed? Do you think coyotes are villainized for the reasons wolves are? Most definitely. So let's take the villainization first. Uh, they are as persecuted, if not more so than wolves. Uh, the fact that they um, are very adaptable to urban environments means that they run up against uh, communities and humankind very often. And um, so they are uh, cosmo cosmopolitan species. Uh, and you really don't need a permit in most states to shoot coyotes. Um, they're not an endangered species. So uh, depending on where you are, uh, but most most places in, in, in the states, it's um, coyotes, you can you can shoot them on site. Uh, there are things known as wildlife killing contests that target coyotes specifically and foxes and badgers and all sorts of other uh, wildlife. And these killing contests usually focus on coyotes. It's true that uh, as, as carnivores, uh, they're very territorial as are wolves and wolves and, and coyotes will self-regulate basically. So if you take out the wolves, yes, the, the coyotes are going to proliferate. And this is kind of, um, where killing programs don't work in the sense that when you fracture uh, the family group and, and take out uh, individual wolves or coyotes, um, you actually might be promoting an increased reproduction, especially for coyotes. So lethal killing programs don't work and they also um, don't fix problems when you have a wolf that might be preying on cattle uh, and trying to target one or two individuals, um, those programs have been shown not to work. So these killing programs, uh, we believe are, are wrong and there are other ways to address coexisting with wolves and, and with other predators, including coyotes. But coyotes cause problems for, for ranchers and producers, livestock producers too. Uh, and they kill livestock too, but it's 
you know, it's always scapegoating the wolf, it seems, rather than scapegoating bears or cougars or even coyotes, but they're all under the gun, literally. Um, how do indigenous people react to wolves being released back into Colorado? So when we, when we think about in indigenous peoples and cultures, it's not a monolithic uh, um, choice of, of how peoples uh, respond to wolves in Colorado. So I, what I'm referencing is the, the two um, tribes in Colorado, the this, this Southern Ute, and the, and the Ute Mountain Ute tribes, um, they are actually skeptical about returning wolves to Colorado because uh, they, they participate in ranching. So um, they have not issued a statement for or against reintroduction. Um, they have been consulted by the state wildlife agency. Um, and there are some indigenous uh, tribes in, in the Pacific Northwest that do hunt wolves as well. So it's, um, you know, globally and um, predominantly indigenous cultures revere the wolf, but there are exceptions. Um, after the wolves are released, if they were to cross over into other states, would they be safe or would they be hunted slash killed? They will be hunted slash killed. And those, you know, only I say that because although the CPW will be trying to collar at least several wolves in each pack. Every wolf in Colorado will not be collared. So there was a recent incident that involved wolves that migrated into northern Colorado from Wyoming up in north, the North Park area. They did depredate on some cattle uh, and caused, caused some problems. Um, there were about eight wolves. Uh, the pack traveled back into Wyoming and three of those wolves were killed. So half of the pack is gone now. And that same fate will meet any wolf that is unlucky enough to wander out of the borders of Colorado into the hunting zone of Montana, Idaho, and Wyoming. And if it's a collared wolf that, you know, they are technically will be protected under the 10J rule uh, as being, you know, an introduced wolf into, Col wolf into Colorado, but uh, we know that that's not necessarily a protection either. A, a collared wolf, um, people will be monitoring it, but it doesn't mean that it's protected against hunting. Um, we hope that th that will provide a little bit of an incentive not to, to kill a wolf because there would be uh, fines and penalties associated with that. So, um, but for those uncollared wolves, they're you know, they're going to be at, at, at risk at all times if they wander out of the state. So should we, uh, what can we do to help the wolves? Hmm. Well, I mentioned some things in my presentation. I think that everybody has a unique talent and has a unique voice. Uh, you can make phone calls to legislators. There's, there's probably eight different pieces of legislation uh, in, in federally and in the states that deal with wolves and hunting wolves, uh, whether it's Wisconsin or Minnesota or Michigan. Uh, currently, we're waiting for the De Department of Interior to make a determination about the Northern Rocky Mountain wolves uh, in, in Wyoming, Montana, and Idaho, because those were listed delisted separately under congressional action. So that little pocket of wolves uh, are being managed by the states, and you can see what's happening there. They're being, they're being you know, reduced uh, through hunting, uh, their numbers are being reduced through hunting. So if you go to the OPS website, we do have an action center and you can go there and you can send a letter to Secretary Deb Holland at the Department of Interior, encouraging her to relist that population of wolves. But using arts, using your voice, uh, sharing some of the videos that I shared today so that the truth about wolves can be, can be told, that's all something you, you can do and to share with your family and friends. Uh, oh. Oh. Bro, that's not even a question. For real. 
Is your training in science or the arts? Hmm. It's a little bit of both, but it's primarily the sciences. So I have a degree in wildlife biology, uh, law, and psychology. So I'm kind of a hybrid animal, uh, and that was by design. I really believe that scientists should be advocates as well. And I know there's a tendency sometimes for scientists not to speak out for fear of um, the perception that it might be uh, not be objective or, you know, not be unbiased or jeopardize neutral science or, uh, you know, objective science. But being a scholar advocate is so important because if you don't apply the data or apply the science, um, what's the point? In my, in my view. So I think uh, arguments uh, about ethics and justice are just as important as the science, having said that. And the arts are so important in touching people and moving people and inspiring people in ways that science can't do. So I think it takes all approaches to, to get to the end goal that we want. How do we help with 114 if we don't live in Colorado? Well, the public process has concluded as of, of this week. The last meeting was in Denver. So um, you, still, you still can submit comments until April. If you, and I can share the link, you can go to the CPW website and submit comments for consideration. Um, I think the best thing though to help is to, um, try to support wolves outside of Colorado as well, because Colorado wolves may wander into the hunting zones in, in the Northern Rocky Mountains. And I think the best thing is to really work with your friends and family to dispel the myths around wolves. Uh, there's such a negative narrative and, and uh, misperceptions about wolves, whether they're going to you know, harm you when you're hiking in the forest or harm your dog or, you know, harm cattle, um, we know that there's very, very little of that that happens uh, ultimately in all the states that, that coexist with wolves. So uh, the best thing is just to support the wolf in general and to keep an eye on what's going on in Colorado. There was a discussion about potentially opening up recreational hunting for wolves in Colorado when their numbers grow enough to allow hunting. And that means Colorado would be just like the states around it in Montana, Wyoming, and Idaho. And we don't want to see that happen. So keeping an eye on what's happening in Colorado as wolves come back, there will be more opportunity for the public inside and outside Colorado to, to get involved. What does it mean when you say they have to resolve conflicts between wolves and livestock? So sometimes wolves do kill cattle or sheep. And so that's a conflict when um, it creates a conflict for the wolf and the livestock, and it creates a conflict between the wolf and human, human communities. Uh, and there were, there's lots of concern from ranchers and livestock producers that bringing wolves back will put them out of business. And we know that wolves kill less than 0.01% of cattle. More cattle are killed by weather events, um, and disease and accidents on when they're grazing on public land. Sometimes livestock is left alone for one week to two weeks without any uh, human intervention. And lots of things can happen to, to, to cows out there when they're grazing on public land. Uh, so wolves do very little damage at the end of the day. And part of the plan is to compensate livestock producers when there's confirmed, when it's confirmed that wolves have killed livestock. So they'll be taken care of. Um, and of course, bears and, and mountain lions also kill cattle. And when you look at it, it's the cost of doing business in the wilderness. When you're grazing a non-native invasive species known as the cow, <laughs> um, they're going to run into wildlife. And, and that's really the price of, of grazing cattle on, on public land. So, but that's what we mean by, by conflict. And we're working really hard to work with ranchers uh, and wolf advocates to bring them together so that we can have these discussions to really build tolerance and respect for each other because you know we're all human beings and we all have livelihoods and while we advocate and want the 
want the scale to tip on the on the side of wildlife, we have to we have to be compassionate and, and support human communities too, of course. Science for our future said, so what happens if the wolves are restored west of the continental divide and they walk across the divide to the east side? So the, that's a great question. So the wildlife plan, the wildlife management plan um, and wolf management plan allows for wolves to exist wherever they can find suitable habitat. So it's an impact based plan, which means they're not going to, the state's not going to manage to the, to the number of wolves necessarily, but will uh, manage to the amount of conflict. So it's an impact based plan. So if wolves migrate uh, to the east, to Eastern Colorado, which they will, um, if they're not causing problems, they're gonna let them be. And unfortunately we've seen with other reintroduction programs like in Arizona with a Mexican gray wolf that wolves are kept to an artificial boundary. There's a, a highway I-40 uh, that runs from Arizona to New Mexico. And if a wolf travels north of that border, they actually capture that wolf and take them back south uh, because they're trying to constrain that population to a certain area to reduce to reduce conflict, uh, quite frankly. Um, but that's not a, that's not natural. I mean, wolves are migratory, uh, far ranging, you know, carnivore species, and they will they will travel east of the divide. So the, the goal is that um, it will be taken uh, over time to see what kind of conflict they run into. And hopefully not much, because then they can they can live in those areas throughout the state, not just west of the Continental Divide. Uh, how many wolves are dying each year? Um, so I, I gave a number of about 700 wolves uh, between the three states. So it, it, it varies, but about 250 to 300 uh, wolves per state. Uh, you, is 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 the number usually coming out of coming out of those three states where wolves can legally be killed now? There was a, a brief moment of time when the wolf was delisted, and Wisconsin had a hunting season, and um, they killed over two hundred wolves in less than forty eight hours, and that, that was obscene, uh, and so that was quickly shut down after petitions from citizens like you and me. Uh, and lawsuits were brought, and uh, indigenous peoples spoke out, and uh, that that hunting program will be reevaluated. Of course, now the wolf is listed again on the Endangered Species Act, so that 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 hunting program in Wisconsin is not legal. Uh, but it, 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 again, uh, the wolf may be delisted, and these programs will continue. So it's 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 really important for all of us to work together to. Um, share accurate information about the wolf and what they do for ecosystems and, and natural communities and to keep an eye on what the states are doing uh, because they'd rather eliminate the wolf and, and not deal with the conflict that it brings, uh, that the wolf brings. So we gotta, we gotta stay vigilant. Um, so fifth grade dual language heritage is asking, can we have a copy of the resources? Great information. Um, and they want to be able to help write letters and help fundraisers. So is there any way like you could give a link to your presentation? Yeah, you guys can all have the presentation and I'll send I'll send a link to our action center. Uh, <laughs> there's some there's some great videos beyond the ones that I shared that that you can enjoy. There's a, a wonderful program called the Wolf Quest. Um, by Project Hero, and it's for students and educators, and it's right about the, you know, the right um, level, grade level that that I'm that I'm speaking to you guys today. So it's 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 fun, it's engaging, and it's informative. So there's some great resources that I can share with you. Does OPS have any idea why Secretary Holland hasn't already re-enlisted gray wolves? Oh gosh, that's the thousand dollar question, really. Um, and you know, there's been there's been so much outreach from indigenous communities to Secretary Holland as well about the wolf, and the Global Indigenous Council with the Wolf Treaty. I think that um, it's difficult because Fish and Wildlife has not has not established a, an official recovery plan uh, across the United States for the wolf. So 
Um, the numbers that are needed to delist the wolf are uncertain. So you have some states saying, well, we've got 1,000, 1,200, 1,500 wolves. That's well over ecological carrying capacity. That's more wolves than we need. I think it's time to do, you know, delist them and, and hunt them down to a minimum level. So uh, I, I, I think it's controversial. I think uh, anybody in a, a regulatory position like that makes trade-offs and has other priorities. It may be a priority for us, but there are lots of, lots of issues that she's facing and confronting and she has to, to make choices between those. So I'm not going to speculate uh, why, but because it's so highly controversial and the states, state voices on this issue are very strong, including coming from Northern Rocky Mountain states. Um, you know, I, I feel like the wolf will continue to be scapegoated you know, at the end of the day, and, and, and which is why this initiative in Colorado is so important. And I hope that we can get it right and be different. What major legislative changes have you helped make? So at, at OPS, well, I would, I would call uh, bringing wolves back to Colorado, Colorado a major, a major um, legislative change because Proposition 114 was then codified in statute. So it's state law. Uh, but but we've worked and I've worked to uh, prohibit seabed mining off the, off the coast of, of California, uh, uh, help to end orca breeding and captivity in, in, in California. And we're working on a federal bill that would do the same to, so that we would uh, prevent whales and dolphins from being held in really small concrete tanks. Um, we've, we've helped pass legislation on um, reducing vessel a speed to reduce collisions with whales uh, on the East Coast. We also helped um, pass a ban on drift nets off the coast of California in federal waters, which uh, it's one of the largest uh, uh, sources of bycatch for marine mammals. They get caught in these nets that are catching swordfish uh, off the West Coast of, of the US. Um, and we're working on a, a bunch of other legislation that's in motion, um, including shutting down the aquarium and reef trade. So capturing fish um, from Hawaii, for instance, and uh, having those fish be caught up in the global reef fish trade. So just a, just an example of some of some of the work that uh, legislative work that, that we're doing. And we're always trying to increase uh, funding and resources for law enforcement for um, for those uh, agencies that are working hard to implement the Marine Mammal Protection Act and the Endangered Species Act and that type of thing. What are your opinions on crossbred coyotes? Um, live and let live. I, I guess I don't have an opinion. Uh, in nature, I, I'm not sure if they're talking about, um, there's some uh, speculation that the red wolf is, is actually uh, a species of, of coyote and a wolf hybrid um, and crossbred. I think that maybe that's what you're referring to as crossbred uh, coyotes, but uh, whatever happens in nature and if there are hybrids that result, um, I believe that they should, um, you know, be protected and continue to um, find their way in whatever suitable habitat they find their way in. And that would, that would extend to the Mexican gray wolf as well, because the Mexican gray wolf is just canis lupus, as is those, you know, those wolves that will be brought in, excuse me, from the Northern Rocky Mountains as well. So, you know, there, there are considered five subspecies of gray wolves and there is potential for interbreeding between those, those different uh, hybrids, including, as I mentioned, the Mexican gray, Mexican gray wolf and any wolves that would be brought into Colorado. But unfortunately, per the United States Fish and Wildlife Recovery Plan for the Mexican gray wolf, which is considered a separate uh, subspecies, they won't allow that connectivity between the wolves to, to occur. And we were hoping that that would have happened. We, would, we, we were hoping that any wolves that migrated in from the south would be allowed to stay. But uh, a current law and policy uh, requires them to move those Mexican gray wolves back into the southern boundary. So, so I, I don't know if that answers your question, but uh, you know, I believe in allowing nature to do what nature does. Can you see this project spreading to other states? 
Yes, I, I, I hope so. I, I think uh, wolves would return to other areas uh, on their own if they had the chance, uh, but they don't have the chance. And in some places they need extra help to, to do so. Um, you know, the wolves are currently only living in 15% of their historic range. It's a very small percentage of the United States. So I hope that this, this could encourage other states to do the same. And maybe even the next step would be to reintroduce grizzlies uh, to Colorado. <laughs> so it could lead to other species reintroductions as well. Uh, Colorado had great success with reintroducing the lynx uh, to, to, to the state. So there are other introduction programs that have worked too. Um, Melanie Byers from Kettering Middle School said, how do you introduce new wolves? So in this case, they're going to do what's called a hard release. And they're literally going to fly in and uh, capture wolves. They're going to dart them or net them. So they'll, they'll dart them from a helicopter or net them uh, in the winter time. And they literally will be transporting them directly to the release sites in Colorado and letting them go. That's called a hard release. They'll, they'll take some blood and do, do a, a veterinary analysis and make sure that they're healthy uh, and not injured. And they will be released on the spot. Uh, in the past, the Yellowstone wolves were, were captured um, and brought in from, um, from Canada. And they did a soft release. So they held them in uh, a, confined, a confinement area and act, let them acclimate to the area first before they release them. But it was decided that it's um, more cost-effective and uh, more potentially more successful to just do a hard release. So they're gonna fly in, grab the wolves and put them on the ground in Colorado literally within the same day. So we'll see how that works. <laughs> Do you have any global initiatives or partners to help accomplish other goals around the world? Yes, OPS is, we're a very small team. So we rely upon partners and global collaborators for our campaign work. Uh, and that, that in, again, is across the board, whether it's whaling in Iceland and Norway, uh, we have partners on the ground, whether it's facing the palm oil and deforestation in, um, in Indonesia where we're working, uh, that's, that's part of our model is that we try to really support the frontline defenders that are on the ground, uh, confronting industry or confronting wildlife traders or confronting hunters uh, to, um, to support them because we, we don't have the capacity to do that. So we need to support all of our collaborators around the world. How many species, oh, Melanie Byer says again, how many species of wolves have gone ex extinct? I actually can't answer that question. I'll have to get back to you. All right. And then our last question, do you think crossbred wolves can or should be used to repopulate the species? Uh, again, that's a, that's a tough one um, because naturally wolves will crossbreed, right? And there will be hybrids out there, but because we manipulate uh, the environment and we manipulate uh, wildlife. Uh, there are those that think, for instance, the Mexican gray wolf should not intermingle with uh, northern Rocky Mountain gray wolves. Uh, I believe that they should uh, because they would do that naturally. Um, but we like to put things in boxes and we like to characterize and categorize and label and title things so that we can understand things. And that's what science does sometimes. But I, I, again, I believe in letting nature do what nature does. So I, I'll leave it there. All right, before we end for the day, we have one announcement to make. Um, National Biodiversity Teach-In is a student project that happens because we have so many partners supporting us. One of those partners is Earth Echo International. We are excited to partner with Earth Echo International to promote an opportunity to empower our peers across the country. This year, Earth Echo is excited to open our Echo, Echo Challenge STEM competition to students in the US, grades five through ninth. 10 finalists will advance for a chance to win the top, win top prizes of 1,000, 2,500 and $5,000. If you have any questions, please feel free to email us. Thank you so much for your presentation. We really appreciate that you dedicated your time to this. 
and hopefully we can see those wolves getting the love that they deserve. <laughs> so. It's been my pleasure. Thanks.